Good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Bay Presbyterian Church. My name is Roger Lee, and it's a beautiful day. And even though we lost one hour, the sun is shining, and we, we gain that hour tonight. What That's going to be wonderful to have an extra hour of light for the next six months, right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody online, and please make sure you, your cell phones are turned off so we don't have any interruptions while we prepare for worship. I'll be reading from scripture, and then I'll pray after that. So the scripture reading I'll be reading from is Psalms 105. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known all the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day again. Thank you for this privilege and honor we can worship you freely today. Prepare our hearts as we uh, worship you in song, through song and listening to this sermon, Lord. So continue to bless us this day, and thank you for this time again. To, we have freely to worship you. Amen. Okay, you can take one minute, one minute only. Just the, Last time was too long, I was told, but to, to greet the people around you real quick, okay? Thank you. All right, as you find your way back to your seats, I would ask if you can to remain standing. As Roger said this morning, we, we need to call upon him. Um, there are so many times when in our lives we forget that, that God needs to be at the center of our lives, that everything that we have is his. Everything we do should be honoring unto him. So as we begin to worship this by singing this morning, I would ask that you remember that. And just thank you for being here this morning with us. It's good to see all of you here and those online.
Heavenly Father, yes, you are holy forever. You will forever be with us and forever be in our presence. Lord, be the center of our lives. Heavenly Father, be the fire in our hearts and the source of our lights. In your Son's precious name, amen. Good morning, friends. Good to see everyone here this morning. And I can't believe that you're here, Arnold. <laughs> so the rest of us, first of all, it's great that you're here because this is the morning when if you hadn't changed your clock, you would show up about an hour from now. So, you're here. So, good job. Arnold got back from a mission trip to Mexico yesterday. They got back at, what, 2 a.m., approximately? That's when you're going to get back. 2.30. <laughs> so, Arnold went down with one of our uh, youth group members, uh, Patrick Juan, and we're looking forward to hearing about the trip. We've been praying for you, but so excited uh, that you had the chance to do that, but so impressed that you're here. So, Thank you. <laughs> so we as a church, as a community of believers, as a family of God and the body of Christ, we feel like we're put here in this place for a reason. It's not an accident that any of you are here, and it's not an accident that all of us are here in this community. God has put us here for a reason. But that doesn't mean it's easy. It can be very challenging to figure out, God, how do we really represent you in this place? How can we be missionaries in a culture that is more and more uh, growing very distant from Christian faith, even having an understanding of what it is? 
How can we share this with our friends? The greatest love that we can have for those around us is to love people in Jesus' name. And the best thing we can do in Jesus' name is actually introduce people to Jesus. So we have been thinking about this. Your, your session, your elders have been thinking about this over the last year. And uh, we decided that this year of 2024, we really want to focus on outreach, ways that we can just be more intentional about sharing our faith. And so we have kind of our big initiative is during the season after Easter, we are going to offer Alpha. We've talked about Alpha before, and we're going to keep talking about it. Uh, it's getting closer and closer. It's about five weeks off. Um, but mid-April, we're going to start a series of Wednesday evenings of having a meal together, watching a short presentation about some aspect of Christian faith, and then having a small group discussion about it. And the idea is to create a safe place for people to be able to engage and encounter Christian faith. So we're going to watch a short video right now um, about somebody who uh, really had a wonderful experience uh, because somebody invited them to Alpha. I moved to New York in July of 2019. I had just graduated college. I, um, I'm an actor, so I have always had a dream of moving here. Um, and I, when I moved here, I, I was so focused on doing everything right for my career. Um, it was my entire life, my entire focus. Um, and then COVID hit. When I realized that my career and my life before COVID wasn't going to be going back to normal as quickly as I wanted it to, um, I fell into a really dark place because I, you know, was making this transition into adulthood, into having a career, into finally being able to realize these dreams. And, you know, my whole world just fell apart. I was struggling with the loss of my parents' marriage, and I'd also lost a friend to suicide. So. I was in just about the lowest place you could imagine. And I ended up getting a phone call from my friend Ashley and she called just to check in. I asked Ashley, I don't know how to start. Where do I just begin um, to seek God in my life? And Ashley invited me to Alpha on Zoom. I had been invited to Alpha in 2019 um, before the pandemic and at that point I said oh sure 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 yeah I'll come and then um, I didn't I never showed up and that's because I was so focused on having this uh, perfect acting career that I didn't think I had the time in my schedule or the space in my head or my heart to, to really um, do that kind of thing I had never experienced um, a space where I could actually ask questions. I think it was really helpful to be in a diverse community and I was also doing it with Ashley because Ashley had invited me and she was my alpha leader as well. So having her there um, created an instantly like safe and comfortable space for me. The leaders really um, were taking such great care of us. I felt so overwhelmed by that because I was like, you know, there's so much love pouring out of these people that I don't, I'm not sure why that they would love me, they don't know me. So week five was the week that we spoke us on prayer. And that was, I think, my favorite week because it was finally the moment where all of this information where I'd learned about the character of Jesus, about what it means to be a Christian, took that 18 inch journey from my head to my heart. It's where it all just sunk in. And still like can't believe that I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah. Those people that were in my Alpha course, um, through them being vulnerable, through them asking the questions that maybe that day I was too scared to ask and I needed someone to ask for me. Um, creating this space of comfort and safety and love and support, um, really, I couldn't have been more thankful 
to have Alpha at that point in my life. And I can't wait to do Alpha again, just because I know that there's always more to gain from that community. Alpha both taught me about, you know, who Jesus was, but I got to learn who Jesus is today. Jesus to me is now um, a friend. Um, a friend who is persistent and patient. Um, someone who only wants good things for you. He's someone that is okay with all of the questions <laughs> and all of the messiness of your life. He went from being a really good teacher to me to becoming um, the center of my world. And the person, the being, the spirit that gets me through every day. So friends, lives really are transformed when people come to know the living Jesus. And this is an opportunity for us to just be a, a part of that. We're not making something happen. We're just simply giving God an opportunity to do something. Each one of us has people in our lives that, uh, that we know who we're hoping will come to know Jesus at some point. And perhaps this is an opportunity that God's putting on your heart to invite a friend or a neighbor, a coworker, or a family member to come and experience something that um, you can be assured will be a safe and welcoming experience for people to explore Christianity without any obligation, without any strings attached. Uh, it's several weeks, but uh, if somebody comes the first week and they decide, oh, this is not for me, that is absolutely fine. If somebody comes and they go through uh, all of our Alpha series and at the end they decide, this has been really great, I'm still not sure about it, that is fine too. If someone comes and asks some question they or expresses a, a viewpoint that uh, isn't necessarily uh, exactly in line with what Christian faith is about, they will not be corrected. They will simply be listened to. There's going to be a very clear presentation of the gospel and Christian faith. But from that point on, there's going to be an openness and safety to uh, explore and to listen to one another. All of that and some good food which we know is a great draw for people. So how can you be involved? Because we really want everybody to be involved in Alpha uh, if you are willing to be so. The, group, the best thing you can do is to come and to bring a friend that you would like uh, to experience Alpha. Also, we need people to help out. There's lots of different ways that you can help. We have an Alpha team that is kind of going through training to, to lead this, but we could also use your help. We need discussion leaders. We need people who are just going to be out there welcoming people when they come in. We need people to help with preparing and serving food, uh, setting up and cleaning up, all the things that you would expect would go with an event like this. Uh, we could use help with. There's a sign-up sheet right outside where you can sign up, but there's also these uh, nifty little invite cards that Karen has created for us. Uh, you can grab a couple of these and there will be more uh, each week if you have uh, other friends that you decide that you would like to invite. And it simply says, join a conversation. Explore faith together. You're invited. Alpha. Enjoy a meal with friends and neighbors. Watch an episode on a question of faith. Share your thoughts and hear from others. Connect with new people. So friends, we hope that you'll be involved. We hope that you'll be praying about this and you'll be uh, thinking about someone that maybe God is putting on your heart that you could invite to Alpha. This will start on April 17th and will be a series of Wednesday evenings of a meal, a presentation, and discussion. So join with me now as uh, I pray for the Alpha experience and commit this to God. 
God, we know that you uh, are the God of life, the God of love, that you have created this world, that you love this world so much that you sent your son Jesus into it to save us. And Lord, we know that you desire that no one should perish, but should all people should come to you, Lord, and know you and have your gift of eternal life. So, Lord, as we seek to do your will, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for um, those who have already stepped forward and want to be a part of making uh, this Alpha program happen here, Lord. So we commit it to you, Lord. We pray that you will be going ahead of us with your spirit, that you'll be preparing the way and that you'll be preparing the hearts, Lord God, of everyone who will be involved. Uh, whether it's someone coming to help out or whether it's someone who perhaps will meet you for the first time. Whatever it is, Lord, we commit it to you. Pray that you will give us courage and vision, that you'll provide everything that we need, that you'll be glorified through this, Lord God. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'll invite Carol to come up and read our scripture. I'm going to be reading Mark 10, 17 to 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May God add his blessings to these words. Please pray with me. Lord God, we ask that you will speak to us through your word this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, how many of you remember a television show from the 1970s that was called Little House on the Prairie? Yeah? Some of you? Yeah? So this is a you know, very good, wholesome show. Very family show. It was one of those that, uh, you know, Christians and church people could let their kids watch this show and feel okay about it. It was about uh, this family out on the frontier of the United States in the 
probably 1840s, um, kind of as the westward expansion was taking place and all of the experiences they had, as recollected uh, many years later by uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, who was a, a young girl as she was going through this. And her father was very restless. They started out uh, in the woods in Kentucky and then as soon as there was a neighbor that was like within uh, earshot or, or within line of sight, they would move <laughs> somewhere else because they just kept wanting to get further away. There's one story that I remember uh, it really struck me because they were way out on the edge. And I think that there was uh, some kind of unrest and they had to move through this particular section of uh, the prairie quickly. Um, so that they uh, would not um, be attacked. And as they were moving through, they were in an area where there was really no food, no water. They just needed to get through it as fast as they could in their wagon. And they would, from time to time, come across someone else who was out there. And if uh, their wagon had broken down, they would stop and try to help them out so that they could get through there as well. And they came across this one very interesting um, family. It was, it was just a couple, and they were there with their wagon. And their wagon had uh, broken down. The wheel had broken or something. And in the back of it, they had all of this really nice, furniture, you know, beautiful dressers and bureaus and bed frames and things like that. And they were taking this out to their new life on the frontier out in the middle of nowhere, which was strange to begin with. The tragic part of it was that their wagon had broken down and Laura's family was uh, offering to give them some transportation. We'll, we'll give you a ride out of here so that you don't die. We'll get you to uh, a safe place. And this couple said, well, we would have to leave our furniture behind if we did that. And they said, well, yeah, you're going to have to leave your furniture behind if you want to live. And they wouldn't do it. They would not leave. They said, no, we'll figure out something else. And so Laura and her family finally reluctantly moved on without them and left them out there with a pretty strong sense that this couple probably was not going to make it through alive. But all they could see, all they could focus on was this very nice furniture that they just loved so much and couldn't imagine letting go of and leaving behind. It's a very fitting illustration, I think, for what's going on in the mind of this young man that Jesus has this conversation with. This man is noteworthy. In the other passages, the other Gospels that tell this same story, he's described variously as a, a rich young man or a rich ruler. Here in Mark, though, it's very simple. He's just a rich guy. And he comes to Jesus, and he wants to know, all right, uh, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? He's not saying, what do I need to do to go to heaven? He's saying, what do I need to do to inherit this life of the ages, this life that God has for those who are faithful to him? And Jesus looks at him and he lists off several of the commandments, the Ten Commandments. He says, all right, well, here you go. Don't murder anyone. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't lie, in other words. Don't defraud anyone. That one's actually not one of the Ten Commandments, but it kind of fits right in there. Don't cheat anybody. And honor your father and mother. And this rich man says, you know what? 
I've been keeping all those commandments since I was a boy. I've, I've done all that. And there's this sense that he knows that there's something more, that Jesus is a master, and Jesus has some kind of special angle here. And this guy knows that he wants what Jesus has to offer. And we have to believe that he's sincere, that when he says that he has kept these commands, that he means it, that he's not simply uh, tooting his own horn, self-righteous, although, you know, we could question whether anyone actually really keeps all those commandments, even on the heart level, but we'll give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Yes, I've done those things. I've, the, the wealth that I have has not come at anyone else's expense. And this was actually an attitude in the ancient world where they had a sense, these were not modern capitalists, they had a sense that there was a fixed amount of wealth out there. And so if it was spread around, everybody would have a little bit of it. But if you had a lot, that meant that you had it at the expense of someone else. So oftentimes, the regular people who were mostly poor would look upon those who were rich and often feel that they had taken advantage of everyone else and they didn't like them very much. And this guy is making very clear, you know what, I did not get this at anyone else's expense. I have not cheated anyone. I've been righteous in every way I could possibly be. So as Jesus looked at the man, this is one of the, the very few places where you see this deep personal sense here in a story. He says, says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. The sense that Jesus looks upon this man and knows him. He knows him deeply. He knows what's going on in his mind. He knows what he's struggling with. He knows him on a heart level. He says, you, there's one thing that you still lack. And then he drops the bomb. You need to go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then you can come and follow me. And it says at that point, the man went away very depressed because he was very wealthy. And Jesus turns to his disciples at that point and says, it is really, really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's actually hard for anybody to enter the kingdom of God. But for a rich person, it's especially hard. In fact, it would be easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And at this point, his disciples look at one another and kind of go, oh, yikes. Then who can be saved? Because they also had this view that if somebody like this man, a righteous man, was wealthy, then that was actually a sign of God's blessing, that God had blessed this man. And he was exactly the kind of guy that they thought was the perfect candidate to be a disciple. And I can relate to this, because I know, having been a pastor for a number of years, that when you have a visitor who walks into your church and you see this nice young man and woman, well-dressed, attractive, with their young children, walk in, as a pastor, you're thinking, this is what I want to fill my church with. I want this kind of people all through my church because they clearly are successful, they clearly have money, 
and they clearly want to be here. They are good, upstanding citizens, perfect candidates for church membership. Well, you know what? It's been a long time since that idea was swept from my mind because I realized that these outward signs of success are actually the things that so often get in the way of us following Jesus. And I now believe that the ideal church is the church that is filled with the misfits of the kingdom of God. Because it is in the midst of our weakness. It's in the midst of our failures. It's in the midst of our shortcomings that we are truly in place to be open to receive the grace of God. Jesus is the same one who just, just a few verses earlier has said, you know what? Let the little children come to me because his disciples had been keeping them away saying, no, they'll get in the way. And Jesus said, no, let them come, because you know what? It's to these, the weakest and the most helpless of us all. It's to these that the kingdom of God belongs. Indeed, all of you must become like children, stripped away of all pretense and power, completely dependent. Become like children to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples who thought, man, if this guy can't be saved, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, yeah, you're right. It's impossible. It's impossible. No one can be saved on their own. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Well, as we focus in on the meaning of this text for us, It really says some disturbing things about wealth and possessions. And if you are like, I think, most of us in this room, we probably don't consider ourselves necessarily to be wealthy because we know plenty of people who are far wealthier than we are. And it's easier to compare ourselves with them. We might have many possessions, but we might also have an incredible amount of debt. And so... We feel as if we're poor. The fact is, though, that relatively speaking, compared to most of the world and compared to most of the people who have ever lived, most of the people in this room would be considered wealthy. And we live in a society and we live in a time and we live in a culture when we simply have lots of stuff, don't we? I hear people complain about how much stuff they have. Oh, I've got so much stuff. I've got a whole room in the back that's filled with stuff and I need to go through it. And I just don't want to, or I don't have time. I don't know what to do with it. My garage is full of stuff. Or one of my parents needs to move or has passed away and I have to go through their stuff now. There's stuff and more and more stuff. We might be drowning in it, we feel. And you know what? All this stuff, it turns out, is a liability to us from Jesus' point of view. Now, Jesus here, we need to be careful. It's a very nuanced story. Jesus does not uniformly condemn all wealth and all material possessions or call everyone to a life of poverty. He does not do that. We have examples of other people who are followers of Jesus. For example, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, the one who wrapped his body and prepared it for burial and donated a tomb for Jesus to be buried in, a man of great wealth and prestige. He's just one of many who we know were followers of Jesus and we don't hear that this was something that they were called to do. In some ways, it would be easier if Jesus did just say, all right, if you want to be my followers, you need to get rid of this, 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 and this. And we would have a checklist and just kind of go down it. It would be more straightforward. 
but instead it's something that we, along with every single generation of Christians for the last 2,000 years, has had to struggle and figure out what does this mean for us. The universal seems to be that wealth and possessions are a major stumbling block. What is a stumbling block? Just use your imagination. You're running down the hill and all of a sudden there's this big stone in your way and you trip over it and you fall and you wipe out. That is a stumbling block. It's something that gets in the way. Just like that family out on the prairie, what's keeping them from staying alive? It's the fact that they have a giant hand-carved wooden chest of drawers that they just can't let go of. It's in their way. It's keeping them from life. And wealth and possessions can keep us from entering the kingdom of God. And again, think of the kingdom of God not so much as heaven or the place you go when you die, but the kingdom of God is what God is doing right now in this world around us. The kingdom of God is where God rules or where people allow God to rule and God is doing amazing things and God wants each one of us to be a part of that. What's keeping us from being a part of the kingdom of God? Wealth is one major thing. It's really difficult for a rich man. It's difficult for anyone. It's costly for anyone to be in the kingdom of God. You must become like a child. Last week, you must become a servant to others rather than be served. Or the week before, you must learn to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. It'd be easier for a camel to enter the eye of the needle. Now, maybe some of you have heard that there's actually a gate in the wall of Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. There's really not. There's not a gate. There's not some way to make sense of this saying. It's ridiculous. It's meant to be ridiculous. There are some people have said, well, the word for camel is the same word for rope. So it just means trying to get a really big string through a small hole. Well, that's fine. It's still impossible. The hole is really small. The rope, the camel, whatever it is, something really big. Jesus is using hyperbole as he often does. He's a master of this kind of thing because he's trying to get your attention. This is hard, so take it seriously. What is God calling you to do? What do you need to let go of in order to be a part of what God is doing? What's standing in your way? Now, with this young man, or this rich man, it's noteworthy that of the Ten Commandments, the ones that Jesus doesn't mention at first are perhaps the most important. Almost like bookends, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. The last commandment is, you shall not covet. You shall not allow greed to rule your life. And these were the two issues for this man. His possessions evidently were his God or his gods. That's what he served. His heart was focused upon them. And his heart was focused upon acquiring them, holding on to them, not releasing them, perhaps showing them off to others. How others saw him was important to him. They consumed his heart and his mind. And that's what covetousness or greed is. The need to have more and to hold on to things like a security blanket. But to let go of those possessions was the one thing that he could not do. And that's what kept him from following Jesus, from entering into the kingdom of God. What does it mean in this case to follow Jesus. What does it mean to enter the kingdom of God? Well, in this case, it's radical trust. To say that all that we have belongs to God. And that's an easy thing to say, but it's a harder thing to actually experience. And sometimes to experience it, it means that we might have to let something 
go. We might have to listen to what God is saying to us. Maybe there is something in your life that he's calling you to let go of, to give away, in a sense, to sell and give the money to the poor. But you know what? No one else can tell you what that thing is. Only God can point it out to your heart. Only the Holy Spirit can work upon you and say, you know what? This has become an idol for you. Or maybe it's everything that we have has become an idol for us. What would it mean to store up treasure in heaven rather than here on earth where it doesn't last? And this is where I think the idea of generosity comes in. That generosity is an antidote to greed. For this man, Jesus didn't need his money to give to the poor because God has all things. But not only did Jesus want to use this man to bless the poor, but he also knew that this would bless the man himself. That learning to actually live in a posture of open-handedness, to let go, doesn't always mean that God is necessarily going to take what we have, but it means he can, and we will allow him to. So greed isn't necessarily, or greed is really the enemy of the good, but generosity is what God is calling us to do. Generosity is the way that Jesus lived. And generosity is a way of exercising radical trust in who God is. And this is what I really want to leave each of you with today, is this idea of trust. This is what the rich man couldn't do, but this is what Jesus was inviting him to. Trust in me instead of in your stuff, whatever that stuff might be. And it might be our possessions, it might be something else. But specifically today, let's think about what we have. The things that occupy our mind, our attention, the things that we try to get more of or to hold on to, or the things that become our security, the things that really possess our hearts. And Jesus is saying, do you trust me even more than that? Do you trust me enough to let go of that? Because really, if we think about it, everything we have came from God in the first place. Everything we have is a gift from God. And God is saying, do you love me enough to offer it back to me and then trust that I will take care of you? Do you trust me enough to offer it back to me and trust that I will, in turn, give you something even better? Eternal life, yes, but even in this world, there is going to be rich blessing for those who trust in Jesus. To trust him with our life, trust him with our stuff, trust him with all of our possessions and our wealth and whatever he might want to do with it, but to trust Jesus for our life, life everlasting and life abundant in the world to come and here and now, far beyond what we can ask or imagine. So today, what is Jesus calling you to entrust him with so that you might have the life that he wants you to have. Lord Jesus, we do want the life that you are inviting us to. And so, Lord, as you challenge us today, may we not turn away dismayed by the cost of following you. But Lord, we pray that you will instill in our hearts a deepening desire that can't be fulfilled by anything else than you, Lord God, because you look upon us and you love us and you know us and you call us to trust you so that we might live. Help us to do that. Amen.
Let's pray. O oh, Holy God, our Father, all glory belongs to you. We come to you in prayer to glorify your name, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. We adore you, Lord, for being our Abba Father. Your unconditional love for us stretches to the highest mountain peaks and reaches to the depth of the sea. It is beyond anything we can fathom. Your love never ends and great is your faithfulness. You are worthy. We confess our need for you today. We need your healing and your grace. We need to be reminded that you work on behalf of those you love constantly, powerfully, and completely. Forgive us for trying to fix our situation all on our own. Forgive us for running all different directions and spinning our wheels to find help when true help must be found first in you. Guide us, Lord, in all our ways as only you can do because you know what works best for us. We leave to you our brethren who are grieving, grieving over the loss of loved ones or grieving because of illness, grieving because of financial hardship. We pray especially, Father God, for Sharon Yi, our sister, who will have her surgery tomorrow. We pray, O oh God, that the doctor's healing hand and smooth process for full recovery for Sharon. We also pray for Mei Wang, uh, who had a bad fall last week, but praise the Lord, there's no extensive damage. And we also pray for Duke, for not feeling well today. 
Lord God. May you comfort them, envelop them with your love so they can say again, Father, you are so, so good. Help us to keep our eyes on you and think great thoughts of you. You know, Lord, it's easy for us to get discouraged when we focus on less important things. The news, the economy, the war in different countries, and many more. Gracious Lord, you taught us to trust in you, but we still prefer to trust ourselves. We have offered, you have offered us peace, but we continue to live in chaos. You have offered us rest but we are weighed down with our own sins. Help us, Lord, to surrender our need for control, our need for our misguided self-sufficiency and arrogance. Forgive us our sins, Father. Forgive us, forgive us, and forgive us. Heal our hearts, cleanse our soul, and let us find rest in you. Renew our spirit and fill us with your joy and peace. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are and for all that you do for all that you, and all for all that you have given. Help us to set our eyes and hearts on you. We know, Lord, that everything good will happen in our life when we, you hold it in our hand, in your hands. Take over our life today, Lord, and every day, and let the goodness manifest in our life to the fullest. Thank you for the blessings you give us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for raising him from the dead and that now he now sits in, your, in heaven with you. Thank you for the joy of worshiping you, our creator. Thank you for provisions of life. Thank you for the opportunities to live and know you, Lord, and for the acceptance and forgiveness you have lavished upon us despite our sinful actions and choices. Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for great love and care. Thank you for life, thank you for laughter, for health and happiness, for friendship, for families, for relationship. Thank you for your comfort and your presence in the light of good and bad days. Thank you for what we now have, what we had yesterday, and for what you will continue to give tomorrow. Let us never take that for granted, but always be grateful for every good and perfect gift. Lord, comes from you. Thank you for our church. Thank you for giving us Pastor Kuhn. Please help him to grow in faith each day and to be a man who is, all, who is above reproach. We lift to you, Pastor Kuhn, in prayer, seeking your grace to renew and deepen his joy of serving. We pray for our church leaders, the sessions, the deacons, and the different ministries. And Lord, we pray for all the members of this church. Lord, grant our leaders strength and courage in their leadership. Give them strength to carry out their divine purpose and courage to stand firm in their faith. God of hope, thank you that you are with us in all our fears. Thank you for your faithfulness through time, for the ways you have been there for us in the past and that nothing can separate us from you. Help us to have compassion for those who live in fear, for those who are fleeing bombs and bullets, and for those who face oppression, for those who cannot worship openly but must see, meet in secret. Forgive us for the times we have been to wrap up in our own fears and joys to truly see our neighbor. Help us to embrace joyful living being mindful of the gift of its day, remembering our Savior Jesus Christ who lives in us and through us. Be our guide, Lord, in everything that we do and lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Help us to abide in your word and let it be our guide in all that we do. Help us to make a difference in this world 
for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Friends, this is an opportunity for tithes and offering. God loves a cheerful give heart or cheerful giver. You may use online pay or send to church office. Also, there are offering boxes in the sanctuary to put in your offerings on the left hand side and I think at the lobby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erlinda. You bless us with your prayers. Friends, as we prepare to go, just a couple of reminders here. Uh, it's not too late to jump on board with our midweek Lenten study. Uh, we'll be meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Love to have you join us for that it's a special time as we prepare our hearts for Easter and walk uh, closely with Jesus and discipleship. Easter service at 9 a.m. on Easter Sunday. Mark the time. Uh, love for you to be here to celebrate that with us. We'll also be having a Good Friday service here at 7 p.m. Um, two days before. Love for you to be part of both of those. Some special things that will be happening uh, on Easter Sunday are uh, Easter egg hunt for children of all sizes, and then an Easter uh, potluck brunch, uh, which, if you know, if you've been here before, is always very special. But we do uh, ask that you sign up to, to uh, if you would like to bring some things. There's a sign-up sheet right outside in the um, food room or the foyer. Um, please do sign up for that. Um, but this is also an opportunity to invite uh, a friend to experience uh, Easter Sunday and some good food. And then again, Alpha, um, be thinking about who you might invite, be praying for it, how you might help out, and grab a couple of these invitation cards uh, right outside in the lobby there. Um, so that's coming up. All right, friends, please rise. As we prepare to go, trusting that God is with us, that God has good plans for each one of us, that God is inviting us to share and participate in his mission in the world, friends, receive this blessing. As you go, each of you, may the love of God our Father, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and may the peace of the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.